The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 196. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Welcome back to the EL. Today we have Gary Klein, author of Seeing What Others Don't, The Remarkable Way We Gain Insights. Welcome, Gary, and thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it, Wade. Absolutely. We take just a moment before we dive into your book to introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about you personally. Sure. I'm a cognitive psychologist. Um, I uh, was trained in experimental psychology, and um, I, over the years, I got interested not in, in doing research in laboratory settings, but in seeing how people actually worked outside of the laboratory, specifically how do people make life and death decisions under extreme time pressure and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So we've studied firefighters, police officers, physicians, nurses, pilots, and so forth to see what they actually do. And um, that we, I, we, we looked at how they made judgments, how they made decisions, how they developed intuition. And that led me to the most recent topic, which was how they come up with insights. That's fantastic. And that jumps, that leads us right into your book. Uh, so let's jump into it. Seeing What Others Don't, The Remarkable Way We Gain Insights, which was originally made available for purchase back uh, June 2013. The paperback will, will come out, uh, or I guess by the time this airs, will be out as well, uh, March of, of 2015. And uh, Gary, we're going to move quickly, but our whole goal here today is to cover the top questions that our listener slash future reader would like to get answered. And the first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing, seeing what others don't? Okay, so I, I would make presentations on my, on my work on decision-making to audiences. And I, there was a slide that I would use that had an up arrow and a down arrow. And the down arrow was, if you want to improve performance, what do you have to reduce? That's what, why it's a down arrow. And you have to reduce errors. We all know that. We know various ways of accomplishing that. But that's not enough. If you eliminate errors, you still haven't accomplished anything. So there's an up arrow. What do you want to increase? And the other, what you want to increase is insights. And so I would tell groups that, and they resonated to it. They said, our organization is mostly about the down arrow. What can you tell us about the up arrow? And they kept asking me that question, and I kept saying, I haven't studied it. And after a while, I got tired of being uh, asked the question. I said, I better study it. So that's what got me started. Excellent. And this next question is important because what you and I talked about beforehand, as far as how many books come out for entrepreneurs uh, every single month. So what makes your book different from others regarding the same or similar topic? Right. So um, the book is based on research. It's based on uh, studying 120 cases of actual insights. And I didn't go into it with any ideas, any preconceived notions. I was just curious, where do insights actually come from? And there had been some literature, but the literature was, uh, with a few exceptions, was mostly about laboratory tasks and studying people who really didn't have any investment in coming up with important insights. And we wanted to see people whose careers and lives depended on it, as well as everyday insights. And so um, what's different about, about this book is it was a fresh look at how people actually come up with insights. Excellent. And, and Gary, how did you structure the book, or how would you suggest the reader engage with it? Is this a book they can jump in and jump out based on the information they need at that moment, or did you really design it to be read from front to back? There can be some jumping in and out, but it really follows a, a, an arc. And so the first section is uh, where do insights come from? And it, it not only describes how insights uh, are achieved, it shows how I did the research, how uh, I, I came to the conclusion. So the reader can, can, readers can determine for themselves, do they believe it? Do they trust it? Can they use it? Do they want to expand on it? They can make those judgments because I've included all the, the details about how I did the work. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the outcome of that first part is a, a new model of where insights come from, showing that there are several different paths. Some of it, uh, one of them is a, the traditional path Another one is uh, uh, a path people have heard of. And the third is a path no one had, had mentioned before that came out in, in my research. So there's three different ways that I found that people come up with insights. That's the first part. Second part is, okay, so now we know where insights come from. Why don't we have more of them? And to my surprise, there's a lot of forces that work against having insights. And the most scary and the most important 
possibly to, to your audience, is that organizations are afraid of insights. They claim that they want to promote it. They, they claim they want to encourage it. They believe that they want to encourage it. But insights don't work well within organizations because insights are disorganizing. They're disruptive. And so if you're a manager in an organization, you want to manage a project and, and you want to be able to predict what's going to happen next. You want to make sure there's no possibility of error. Well, you can't do that with insights. Insights will disrupt your plans and they, they, they do carry some, some risk. And so um, managers know they can get in trouble if they, uh, if they ignore the down arrow about making mistakes because people will notice it. Whereas they don't get uh, in trouble if they miss an insight because nobody ever finds out. So all the organizational pressures are working against the organization uh, actually uh, promoting insights. And so that was a very, very discouraging uh, um, result of my research. The third part of the book is about what we can do to try to increase insights. And <coughs> I have some suggestions about what we can do personally. I have some more suggestions about um, what we can do to, uh, to help others gain insights, such as subordinates. In terms, there's, there's some popular books about, how to, about advocating for insights, giving some advice. And based on my research, most of that advice doesn't really apply. And so the book uh, is a critique of, of, of some of the existing pieces of, of advice. And then the third part of the book, uh, in that third part of the book, I have some suggestions about what organizations can do. And I'm working with some organizations that want to increase the number of insights. Um, it turns out that even though organizations are afraid of insights, the people who work there are always are often brimming with insights, and it's hard to get it through the organizational filters. And so, organizations, if they're really serious about one increasing, wanting to increase insights, uh, need to um, examine how much filtering they do. They 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 may want to make sure that there is no single point of failure. That uh, it only takes one person to to veto an idea. And it may be on, on spurious grounds, and all of a sudden nobody ever hears of it again. So, 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 organizations may want to address that issue. And there's actually some research about when organizations really jumped on this Six Sigma bandwagon, and, and that's really about the down arrow, about reducing mistakes. And the organizations that, that jumped on that bandwagon um, turned out to underperform the uh, S&P 500, they, they, they underperformed the, the, the stock market uh, because eliminating errors doesn't give you any accomplishments. And so um, for me, the, the third part of the book is really important because for entrepreneurs and for organizations, if you focus too much on the down arrow, you're, you're trying to avoid errors, you're playing not to lose. And I think what's important about insights is they allow you to play to win. And I think organizations and entrepreneurs um, need to do that. They need to be adaptive. And uh, insights are the core of adaptation. You can't adapt unless you have insights about, oh, that's why it's going wrong, so you can diagnose your problems, or, oh, that doesn't look good, so you can anticipate problems, or, wow, I didn't realize that, so you can spot opportunities. Those are all based on insights, and that's why insights are, are important for both entrepreneurs and for organizations. So Gary, you just did a great job of, of giving us a, a look inside the book, and now we're going to ask you to take it even a step further, and that you know, if the reader could only take away one concept, principle, or action item out of your entire book, everything you just discussed with us, what would you as the author want that to be? That's a horrible question to ask an author because uh, there, there's, there's so many things that I'd, I'd like uh, to convey to the reader. But if, if there is only one thing, the one thing would be uh, th this notion of a, a down and an up arrow um, that too often our thinking is overbalanced about reducing mistakes and being defensive and being careful. And I'm not saying we should ignore mistakes because we don't want to, we don't want to make them. They're costly in a number of different ways. What I'm saying is there needs to be a balance. You need to balance how much energy you're putting into reducing mistakes and how much energy you're putting into gaining insights. In many organizations, they have lots of procedures and rules for how to reduce mistakes. And when you ask them, what do you do to promote insights? They give you a blank look or they'll say, 
we hang inspirational posters on the wall or something like that. That's not enough. And so um, I think there is a, a real source of power here about gaining insights. And I think anybody who's interested in, in adapting successfully needs to take insights more seriously. Mm. This next question might be kind of difficult because I'm asking you for for a, a quote that you, something that you wrote, and that's: Do you have a favorite quote from your book? And will you take a minute to explain uh, what it means to you? Okay, I'm gonna have to put my glasses on for that one. <laughs> I think I go to the very end of the book. Okay, th- th- this is just a, uh, the, the last couple of paragraphs. They say, "I have tried to take some of the mystery out of insights." but I don't want to diminish the awe we feel when we encounter an insight, whether it's our own or someone else's. At these times, something magical has happened. And uh, the the insight that was summoned forth didn't exist before, and now it exists, and that feels magical. It's not mystical, it's not, you know, it's it's, it's not uh, extrasensory perception, but it's, 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 creati- it's creation and it's discovery. And we are often coming up with those discoveries and not taking note of it. And so I want, I want readers to appreciate how much, um, how important a role insight plays in their own lives. Let me, let me just expand on that a little bit if, if, if I can. Yeah, definitely. One thing that, that can happen when people become skilled and become expert is they, they may not gain as many insights. Now, I'm not putting expertise down because in my sample, two thirds of the cases depended on prior experience. So I'm not saying, you know, don't, don't worry about experience or expertise. You should, you should need those. But the problem is the more experienced we get, the more satisfied we are with our ideas and our beliefs, and the more confident we are that we know how to make things happen. And so when we, we notice a new opportunity or we notice uh, something unexpected or an anomaly, we often have the tendency to just dismiss it or explain it away because I know how this is done and I don't want to spend any time because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I've got my routines down. And so when people get into that mode, it's not a mode that's going to promote insights and that, that's going to be a, a, a problem. So what can keep us from getting moving into what I'm calling cognitive entropy and, 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 and cognitive rigidity where they don't have any space. And what keeps them, what keeps all of us from getting, from calcifying that way, what keeps us from, from calcifying are the, is, is the set of forces that drive insights. And the forces are being sensitive to uh, new opportunities and connections, seeing things that, that, that fit together we hadn't noticed before, or spotting a contradiction. And instead of saying, well, maybe that's just sort of an accident, I won't worry about it, taking it seriously and saying, what, is, what could that mean? What are the implications? Or uh, being alert to ways that the assumptions we're making may not work. <laughs> we may think that um, the people who don't get insights are ones who have flawed assumptions. But lots of the people that I studied who did develop insights started out with flawed assumptions. Let's start with, look at Watson and Crick and their famous model you know, of, of, of DNA. You know what their original idea was? They were very proud of it and very excited. They called it the triple helix model. And that was just wrong. It was a double helix. So they started out in the wrong way. And instead of getting trapped by it, they were able to escape from it. And so what, what I'm seeing are these forces that drive insights, I think also drive us to be able to escape cognitive rigidity and cognitive entropy and continue to develop as, as we uh, uh, work on projects and, and, and continue uh, in our careers. Gary, thank you for sharing that extra, that extra bit. And, and because uh, quotes take a little bit more thought than what people sometimes have time for. We'll, we'll reference that in the show notes at the elpodcast.com so they can go back and reflect on that. And Gary, our last question uh, is not so much over your book, but it is asking for not only a recommendation, but the recommendation. A book that uh, you can recommend to our listeners based on the way that it's impacted your life, created a, a paradigm shift or a lifestyle shift. And just to preface, it does not have to be a business book. Uh, this goes back to any book possible. Can you give us a recommendation? 
So I, I'm, I was thinking about one book that really changed my career. It turned my career around entirely. And that, and that book is a book by a philosopher, Hubert Dreyfus, uh, who's at Berkeley. And the book is What Computers Can't Do. And what I found so exciting about the book, at that point, I believed that the mind worked like a computer and it was all about calculations and it was all very mechanical. And um, Dreyfus was able to show that that's only a limited part of the way we think and that uh, there's many other um, forms and, and factors that, that affect our thinking and we, we and our minds are not simply machines, that there is something, um, I don't want to say magical, but there's, there's something uh, very holistic or, or, or integrated about our thinking that isn't captured in, in, in a mechanistic account. And based on that, it changed the way I did research. It changed the way I, I studied decision makers. It changed my understanding about uh, the way people think in, in, in actual settings. So it's the book that, that, that I found to have the highest impact for, for me personally. And it was a very well-written book, so I, I do recommend it. And what was that title one more time? The title is What Computers Can't Do. It's, a, it's an old book. It's by Hubert Dreyfus, D-R-E-Y-F-U-S. Fantastic. And I think it was published in 81. Oh, wow. Okay, we'll, we'll reference that one as well. Okay. Very good. Well, Gary, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for listeners to not only get more information on you, but also get more information on your book, seeing what others don't? Um, it, it, it's available, well, there's a couple of ways. It's available on... Um, on Amazon.com, so they, they can order it uh, on that. Um, a problem I ran into, once once I finished writing the book, it's been a couple of years, and so I continue to think about insights, and I don't want to, you know, just, just turn off my, my, uh, my, my curiosity about insights because the book is published. So I started a blog on psychology today. So uh, for the last couple of years, I've been, every, every month or so, I've been posting pieces on the blog and uh, my, my uh, and anybody who's interested can go to Psychology Today, and the title of the blog of the blog the blog <laughs> the title of the blog is uh, seeing what others don't. Uh, the, the, the same as the book. I've also been working on a training technique that I think can help people gain insights in the workplace, and uh, we've just put up a website for that, and it's called the Shadowbox Training Method. Uh, and it's a way of having people get see the world through the eyes of the experts without experts having to be there. And um, it's, it's a way of, of, of helping people go through a scenario and say, here's what I would do and here's why, and then see what the experts picked and what the reason was that the experts gave and say, ah, I should have noticed that. I should have thought about that. So it's really a, a way of trying to promote insights. And uh, the, the site there is www shadowbox training that's all one word dot com fantastic well gary thank you so much for coming on and sharing your book with us sure it's my pleasure i really appreciate the opportunity wade thank you thanks again for listening in today if you'd like more information on gary or his book seeing what others don't check out the show notes at the elpodcast.com Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.